Hi folks, we are live with the drought workshop and we're in Santa Clarita, California. I'm gonna take it over to Sandra. Hi, good morning everyone from beautiful Santa Clarita Valley. I'm Sandra Patel. I am the uh, chair of the Sierra Club uh, group here in Santa Clarita. And uh, I'd like to welcome everybody uh, who came online to join us. We are streaming with Sierra Club uh, California Instagram Live. We are also streaming on the Stop the Delta Tunnel Facebook group. Uh, both of these are public and hopefully you, you have tuned in to us today. Um, I'm here to welcome you and tell you that we are, Santa Clarita is in the northern part of, uh, of LA County. We are adjacent to the desert. We have extreme temperatures here in Santa Clarita. And so water conservation is really important out here for all of us in Santa Clarita. Today's lineup, we're gonna be talking, today we're gonna to be talking about water conservation. And today's lineup will include, I have everybody written down here. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that we are co-sponsored not just by the Sierra Club Angeles Chapter, but specifically by the Sierra Club Angeles Chapter Water Committee. So I'd like to say thank you to the Water Committee. You're all welcome to come join us at the Water Committee. Uh, we will have Claire from Amigos de los Rios uh, speaking today. Diego will talk to us about water, rainwater harvesting. And we have Katie from Theodore Payne uh, Native Plant Society. And lastly, Peter from True People will be speaking to the group. Okay, I'd like to turn this over to Claire. Thank you, Claire, for coming. My mm -hmm. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning. It's almost, well, it's holidays for lots of folks, and it's exciting to brainstorm about our metropolitan area and how we can be sustainable in the future and where we are at this point. So. Our nonprofit, started in 2003, has been engaged in landscape scale conservation um, of water, habitat, and um, biodiversity. And we really are, is this working? This the microphone, working. sorry. Um, our, our area is an incredibly rich reciprocal relationship between the ocean and the Angeles National Forest and the amazing legacy of first peoples who inhabited this area in an incredibly sustainable way. So our work is to try to connect the dots between the reality of our situation in a desert and where we get our water from the mountains, our, our, our natural water, and how we can do a better job throughout the urban area with green infrastructure to harvest and infiltrate water that we receive when it rains and also run off and really be a little bit more respectful of the, the different ecosystems that define our amazing biodiversity in the Angeles uh, metro area. So we've been working for the past 20 years on really celebrating the two major rivers and the mountains and the ocean that make our world here. The Los Angeles County area and beyond is the ancestral and traditional homelands of the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians, Fernando Tatavian Band of Mission Indians, Gabrielino, Tejon Indian Tribe, Venturino Chumash. These tribes have maintained and continue their connection and relationship with the lands to this day. We acknowledge past, present, and future members of the tribe. We're facing unprecedented challenges with climate change not only have we, are we in an officially declared drought, but we are facing extreme heat and increasing wildfires. So state-of-the-art infrastructure to really put a human face on these issues and address multiple benefits at one time with a focus on water. We've developed this simple vision that we can share with students about our tree seeing the LA Basin watershed from the Santa Monica Mountains, Rim of the Valley, San Gabriel Mountains, as the top part of the tree with the LA River and the San Gabriel River as the trunk of the tree, 
down into the ocean, um, which is ironically soil in this model. How can we work together effectively to really reweave the tapestry? Every culture has an incredibly rich tapestry of biodiversity. How can we acknowledge our tapestry and all be empowered to be part of reweaving to connect nature back into our city for multiple benefits? So the way we've been working on that is what we call the Emerald Necklace, which is a model taken from 1850 in Boston and informed by the native, local native tribes to really be sustainable and look at the urban river corridors as a place to harvest water, protect heritage. And we were very lucky. Sometimes people are so generous with their, their gifts and their knowledge. In this case, when we started the nonprofit, we met with the ethnobotanist of the Tongva Garbalino tribe, and he helped us understand the medicinal, spiritual, structural, and edible uses of key native plants that define our watershed. And that in turn helped us understand how to unfold this rich seed bank into barren areas along the flood control channel of the, in this case, Rio Hondo and San Gabriel River. So, what we've been enjoying doing is changing the use of water in public landscapes from predominantly grass and homogenous culture to more nuanced and complex uh, landscapes where native trees, shrubs, grasses, plants can flourish. So in this case, Lashbrook Park is a park along the Rio Hondo that was barren, had been, uh, herbicide had been used for decades and we work with conservation corps and local community members to turn this into a celebration of native plants and use the colors of the native plants um, to color the wall next to the uh, party wall along the river. Many people have the perception that native plants are gray and brown and have no interest or texture or color. The heritage is incredible and it's a joy to become familiar with these plants. So. Every time we do a public park project, we start with a plant palette um, of the Native American tribe and reinforce, again, the, the medicinal, spiritual, edible, structural uses and have a lot of fun going from more of a monoculture to bringing back the richness and heritage and then incorporating uh, elements that um, include local history. Many, many of our grandparents have incredible archeological and um, agricultural knowledge of their heritage when the rivers ran and were wild and living and the plants, the riparian plants um, that characterize the rivers and helped build homes, serve as you know, eating and medicinal and lots of history integrated into the use of native plants. And we're committed to share this rich history with local elementary school students and bring to life the, um, how the, the, these plants really flourished before we channeled our rivers and tried to control floods and water. So if we look at our bigger picture of the watershed, the whole basin, the Angeles Forest is a huge, um, important place for the 10 million plus people who live here. We got most of our water is saved in dams in, in the forest and imported and, and saved there. And then the San Gabriel River is effectively the open water channel for municipal water supply below. So in order to really imagine conserving water at the, the larger scale and bringing that down to the profound meaning of using a native plant in your home, we're looking at all the layers of what it means to be really holistic as far as our uh, long-term sustainability. So it goes from the bigger vision of the whole watershed to the symbiosis that happens between a native plant and soil, protecting our regional biodiversity, looking at other major metropolitan areas across the country, Chicago, Houston, Cleveland, Portland, the Bay Area, Milwaukee, um, looking at how each of these metropolitan green spaces have really tried from a landscape scale, watershed scale, municipal scale, community scale, site scale, and seed bank 
to bring back native plants and have all of those incredible symbiotic connections between the plants and the soil to match with the diversity of the plant culture in our area, our diverse cultural heritage. In our nonprofit, we really enjoy working directly with community members and recharging every Saturday and Sunday somewhere along the river by bringing native sycamores, cottonwoods, house live oaks, Ingleman oaks, western redbuds, aloe verde, and a whole host of understory plants back to the river corridors. And these in turn connect to the schools that are adjacent to the river corridors. We of course are the most biodiverse state in the US, second only to Hawaii. So we all can have an important role in both conserving water and protecting the food chains that these incredible creatures are, are absolutely interdependent on, including the creature of us. And one in 20 Americans live within an hour of the San Gabriel Mountains where we receive uh, most of our water and waste most of it as it just heads out down the river corridors into the ocean with a load of pollutants. So one of our main focal areas is turning schoolyards into a microcosm of the watershed, really bringing nature to our public schools and mostly Title I schools, where we reconnect students to nature for all the joy that that brings and overcome nature deficit disorder. So we have these amazing rivers within the Angeles National Forest and urban residents Everybody, all of us have a role to play in conserving water and protecting biodiversity. If only we would allow that to unfold in our public schools. Shaking the national forest and the culture down along the river corridors through the different cities that the rivers connect into the classroom, into the schoolyard, has physical wellness, mental wellness, and academic performance benefits. So the Emerald Necklace Forest to Ocean vision plan of saving water across the whole basin really has as its action area public schools. Every public school is a mixture of mostly concrete, asphalt, some grass, and very little difference between a school and a penitentiary except for the locks used. So we've been going around and trying to remove asphalt and protect grass where it's important for soccer and other uh, organized sports, which are sacred and important, but then around the edges of the, of the soccer or baseball fields, football fields, create pockets of diversity and complexity and interest. So there's a greater variety while saving water um, and an opportunity for the school to become a living laboratory for the different principles of the California Education and, and the Environment Initiative to really become real for students. So we're working at a number of Title I schools to create bioswales where there once was just grass or asphalt, dig out the, the asphalt and make uh, many, many little spots where now we have pervious spaces and families and community groups can come, help us remove grass and, and re-inspire the uh, larger landscape uh, microcosm within our individual schools as part of the bigger vision of connecting the mountains to the urban river corridors. So we have, in this case, a beautiful picture of the mulch, the duff, um, oaks, different trees along the creeks, and having finding a way to bring that down through the urban areas and unfold it into different scales of parks that all have one thing in common, the lasagna, the green lasagna, where we're conserving water, planting native habitat, celebrating active transit, cultural heritage, habitat, in this case, a former quarry where there's still groundwater, all the alluvial pebbles used for streets were mined out, and vestiges of the quarry infrastructure left behind. We've worked for the past 15 years to transform this into a, a bird sanctuary. It's one of the only places in East County where you have water year round, and that means you have over 230 species of birds. So using the, the bioswale, using the, the materials that were left on site by the quarry industry to create a 550 foot 
long bioswale. And looking at uh, just a little bit further down the river corridor, a formis, former precious metal smelting factory where asphalt rained. And we were able to bring, um, using water conservation measures, butterfly habitat into this urban park and really focus on what the students had been telling us about seeing pictures of butterflies and birds in their school books, but never actually seeing a butterfly or bird in their neighborhood. So we managed to incorporate uh, the word for butterfly in 70 languages and the milkweed and the different pollinator flowers that the butterflies need to flourish. Another example of celebrating and making more rich public spaces with the use of native plants is a teeny little pocket park under the Metro Link in El Monte where we brought native plants and the bioswales, water conserving elements into the fore at this connection between Santa Anita and Valley Boulevard to celebrate the commitment and the incredible gratitude we have towards our veterans. So if it were just a grass area, the homogeneity and the lack of sense of place would not have done justice to the service provided by the veterans. Um, I mentioned schools. This is an example in Altadena where we are removing about 30% of the asphalt and bringing this green lasagna in with the native plant landscapes. And with native plants, you're saving water. You're also enhancing the soil and bringing it back to life and allowing it to have a more important role in water conservation because when it rains, the soil can absorb more water. We're also adding rainwater harvest and other elements underground and teaching the students about why we're creating these mini aquifers on their campuses. So they'll be experts in the future of how by doing that at their school, they're also being respectful and aware of the role that the upper watershed of the forest plays and understand how the ecology of the whole river system unfolds. Um, this is yet another school site where it was once just grass, and now it's got a little perimeter trail, outdoor classroom, and places for many different students who not everyone enjoys grass and asphalt to have fun while learning about the heritage of our native peoples and our incredible cultural biodiversity as we save water. So to me, looking at the river corridors and seeing every little place where there's a, an educational institution, an opportunity to transform a public park and really absorb the lessons of the, the shamans from the Tongva Gabrielino tribe who were the cultural uh, heritage specialists. So I just wanted to, to brainstorm together with people today and share that using native plants is a way of bringing back incredible layers of richness of our cultural heritage while also addressing climate change and addressing our long-term sustainability. Thank you so much for the opportunity to participate. Thank you very much, Claire. A lot of information in a very short amount of time. I'd like to remind everybody that here in LA County, we have this wonderful uh, forest, the Angeles National Forest. It's one of the few forests that was actually preserved primarily for the benefit of protection of the watershed. So the next time you look at the Sierra Palomas or the San Gabriel Mountains, remember that we're trying to protect our watershed. I'd like to now introduce uh, Diego. Uh, Diego is with uh, um, Greener Way. And he's going to be talking about uh, how we harvest rainwater. So I'm going to turn it over to you now. Can I connect? I'll unconnect. Hold on. Good job. Good job. Cool. Here in Santa Clarita, our major, our major uh, watershed. <coughs> is the uh, we are in the Santa Clara River watershed, which goes from Acton out to Ventura and, and to the ocean. Here's Diego. Yeah, 
All right, let me get set up first. Oh, Diego needs yeah. a moment to set up. <laughs> so while we're talking about uh, water um, in the outdoors, I'd like to encourage you all, uh, we can, uh, I'd encourage you to visit uh, the nature centers here. Um, get yourself outdoors and you can see uh, water in action right now because we actually have water uh, at Eaton Canyon and at Las uh, Vegas Canyon nature centers. And you can actually see how the uh, uh, how the natural environment replenishes itself. We have some beautiful places, beautiful hiking trails. Uh, if you want to go a little further east, we have Asquez rocks out here. And if you go out to uh, the desert, the high desert, we have Devil's Punch Bowl. Each one of these is beautiful. Instead of having huge trees at the desert, we have more desert landscape in Chaparral. Here in Santa Cruz, we have uh, oak woodlands. Beautiful areas of the Charming, would you like to see for just a moment on the water feed while we're waiting? Chair for Sierra Club California, so we have had water issues all over California. And we're happy to be in Santa Clarita today to discuss water and the things that you can do, uh, whether you're a homeowner or you are a renter. Because even if you are a renter, there are things that you can do. Report leaks very quickly to you know the superintendent or the landlord of your building. Make sure they're fixed, um, stay on top of them. You also have low flow shower heads, encourage them to change the shower heads, and the toilets to low flow. All of these help conserve water if you're a renter. And don't forget, you can also, if you have a window ledge, grow some herbs and have a little garden that you can you know, help with your cooking, and so on. So these are just a few tips, apart from those that you know, everybody else knows. Um, with the Water Committee, we do work on lots of water issues. Sierra Club is a volunteer-led organization, so that means when you come in with a problem that's happening in your neighborhood and you ask us to step in, please know that you have to also help and volunteer to step in. If you bring the problem, you have to be part of the solution. That's the way we work. That's how we do things. So uh, there isn't a big staff to help do everything for you. And so I do encourage you to go online. You can go to sierraclub.org. The water committee is SoCal Water, sierraclub.org. We actually have a beautiful website. And there is a children's corner, actually, where the kids can go and play games. And they actually learn about water and recycling. And so I think our next speaker is ready. Diego yes. is here. So <laughs> let's welcome Diego. Thank you, Diego. Thank you. How's this? All right? Okay, hi. So my name is Diego. I'm with the Greenaway Associates. And today we'll be speaking about harvesting the rain. Um, if we can go to the first slide, please. Um, if anybody wants to get a copy of my presentation, I like to start this right away when I start. If somebody wants to follow along on their phone, uh, you can just scan the QR code. I know it's a little bit shaded here. I don't know if I'm making it work or better. But anyways, if you can scan that. What happened in LA with the city? You know, why aren't we doing more uh, rainwater collection? Um, and then, uh, how much water can we realistically collect here? You know, um, a lot of people say, well, you know, LA is pretty dry. You know, is it even worthwhile collecting rainwater? Um, 
Then I want to talk a little bit about passive versus active rainwater harvesting. And then we'll go into the fun stuff as to how to set up some rain barrels. And um, a lot of talk about, you know, can we even use the rainwater for our gardens? Um, and I'll speak more to that in just a little bit. And um, I'll talk about rebates as well. So there's always rebates that we can get for rain barrels. So there's um, a lot of assistance for homeowners and renters to actually start doing some rainwater harvesting. Uh, next slide, please. All right, why harvest rainwater? Well, because it saves our plants, it saves our lakes, it saves our rivers, our oceans, it saves us money, and, you know, in case for an emergency, they have extra money. So what does it mean by saying it saves our plants? Um, and I'll get to that a little bit later in my slides as well, but rainwater is actually really good high quality water that we can use for irrigation and plants don't like that um, sometimes uh, you know if, if, if you have large leaved trees uh, in your backyards, you might see that they have a little rim that is brown yellowish at the edges of the of the tree. And although you water the tree a lot, you say like, why does it have that? Uh, it's not because you're over watering. It's not because you're underwatering. Most likely, it's it's salt deposits from the from using tap water, using drinking water essentially, mm -hmm. to irrigate your plants. Um, by using rainwater, by harvesting rainwater, we actually provide our plants much better water. Um, <clears throat> then, obviously, you know we save our lakes, rivers, and oceans uh, by avoiding more runoff. Um, so when it rains, usually in, in our geographic area here, it, it doesn't rain often, but when it rains, it rains a lot. <laughs> and all that water runs directly into the ocean, into our rivers, um, and drags along the whole pollution of our urbanization. So, you know, all the city, dirt, everything, all the pollution that's on all the surfaces runs into our oceans. And, um, you know, I have this little sign here, every time it rains in LA, the beaches are closed because all that pollution is going directly into our ocean. Um, and then although you're not supposed to drink rainwater, I think in an emergency, if you really have to have water, um, you know, you can, you can filter it, you can boil it, uh, you can make some use out of it. I shouldn't recommend that you drink <laughs> rainwater, but you know, in emergency, you can have it. Worst case, you know, you can use it to flush your toilets, right? If you don't have access to water, you can use it to flush your toilets. All right, next slide, please. <clears throat> All right, so I got this graphic from the USDA um, website. It shows the hydrological cycle uh, in nature and as well as in an urban area. So we can see that when, um, when it rains, you know, water basically recycles itself, right? We have a lake, we have an ocean, we have rivers, water evaporates, it creates clouds, it rains, pours back down, goes into the ground, runs up into rivers, evaporates, and so on. So that's the hydrological cycle. So when that happens in nature, a lot of it goes back into the groundwater, we basically replenish it, we don't lose much water, right? It, it all stays in the, in the cycle and keeps, you know, providing nourishment to our plants and so on. Um, since we like to pave over everything, like to build buildings, um, when it rains, it looks completely different. 
right, in the city. We have very little precipitation, very little infiltration into the groundwater, and we have a lot of runoff. Now, this graphic is made for, um, I guess, general US constructions. It's not specific to LA. It says that we have, on this graphic, it says we have about 55% runoff. In LA, there were studies made. It's actually more like 60 to 65% in LA. So we actually have a lot more runoff, just the way the city is built. Uh, if we can go to the next graphic. So, <clears throat> LA seems to, the way it was built, you know, one could think that we're really against rainwater. It's the worst thing that can happen to us, right? <laughs> Um, and it's like, where does, this, where does this concept come from, right? Why is LA so opposed to rainwater? Um, and it actually comes back a long time ago. So in the 1914, we had a huge flood. Uh, and it created, back in those days, $10 million of damage, which in, in today's dollars would probably be over 100 million, um, over 100 million in, in damages. I think there were like maybe uh, 50 people that died for, Back in those days, this was like huge. <laughs> um, and not, not that any kind of number of that people is good, but you know. <laughs> um, so they required, they requested the federal government to intervene. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers came in, and what happened is that, you know, we started channeling up the LA River. Um, we created a building code that is designed for rainwater to flow the fastest way possible to the, water, to the ocean. Um, no local infiltration um, into the ground. Just get, rid of the, just get rid of the rainwater as fast as possible. Everything goes into ocean. Unfortunately, once it's in the ocean, we can't really use it anymore because it's no longer fresh water. It becomes salt water, and it's not usable for our purposes. So we have these you know, channels everywhere, most of the time they're, they're dry, but you know, we see them during the rainy season, like the last couple of weeks, um, where they just really fill up and it just, it goes away. It's like, we're basically wasting billions of dollars of free, high quality water that nobody's capturing. Um, now we can't do much about that, um, other than, you know, talking to our elected officials and making sure that we change the building code make sure that you know, we put some um, vegetation that can absorb the water, put some swells, um, watersheds back in place in order to do that. Um, but as an individual, if you live in a, in a home, if you have a backyard, if, you have, uh, if you're in a school like this, and you, know, you, can, you can tap into that water and use it and basically slow down um, you know, the loss of water going back into the ocean. Um, so how much water can we really harvest? Um, <clears throat> so I, a little bit of math. So since we're in elementary school, I thought this was appropriate. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so one inch of rainfall on a thousand square foot roof, and that's not very big. So most homes in LA are somewhere between 1,500 to 2,000 square feet. Um, so there's a lot more surface that we can use, but that will be 623 gallons, that is more than 11 typical 55 gallon drums that are typically used for rainwater collection. So that's quite a lot of water, uh, and that's just one inch. So if we imagine, so I've got the stats here for uh, the last period that was recorded for 21 to 22, we had about 12 inches of rain, um, and that's you know, if we, if we break down the calculations, that's 21 gallons a day um, that we could have collected, you know. Uh, and that's only with a thousand square foot, right? Larger surfaces like schools or larger houses, you can collect a lot more. Now, I've got some fun stats here. So, uh, LA residents use about 112 gallons per person per day. Um, so if we take into account that you know, most houses are bigger than that, we could you know, get somewhere between 20 to 40% of that water from rainwater and use it for other purposes. And then it has a very appropriate stat right below that for the LA Department of Water and Power, they say that they estimate about 
35% of the water is being used for landscape. So the numbers actually fit really well. So if we would replace, you know, potable water, drinking water, and just use rainwater for our landscape, we would completely eliminate the need for that. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Okay, so um, there's a couple different ways we can harvest rainwater. There's passive and active rainwater collection. Um, let's start with passive, and so you, you can kind of see the graphic here on the right. Um, this is a very nice landscaping uh, where with, with a lot of native vegetation, <clears throat> where water, where the landscaping is designed for water to sicker into the ground, to flow, nourish your plants, and basically slow down the process of it actually just running off into the sewers, right? Um, on the graphic to the left, you see like a combination. We have a little, little barrel, barrel right there um, that we collect rainwater from the roof, and then there's some overflow that goes into like a little um, basin where water can be collected, right? Um, there's a lot of landscaping that's becoming very popular in doing this nowadays, that you can actually have um, an irrigation-free uh, backyard, basically, where you just shape the yard and put the plants um, in a way so that you can use those, um, <clears throat> that rainwater that we get. And I know that, you know, it's not like in other regions where it rains every week. You know, so we have to figure out a way to do our landscaping to accommodate for us having, you know, rain once or twice a year. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about, more about like, just the basic rain barrel setup. Um, <clears throat> so we have this nice graphic here on the right. Um, it's super simple. I mean, really, rain harvesting, uh, actively rain, um, harvesting rainwater is really easy. Um, it needs, it requires gutters, obviously. So your hole needs to have gutters, needs to have downspouts um, for you to collect that water. Um, you connect it into some kind of storage. Most cases, those are just plastic barrels. Um, you want to make sure that it's slightly elevated, so you can put like um, a bucket or whatever underneath it to collect that rainwater or connect the hose so you can use it. Uh, you want some kind of overflow in case it rains really a lot and it overfills. You don't want to make sure that, you know, that water goes back up your downspout uh, and create other issues. Um, <clears throat> you want to make sure that it's closed up so you don't get too much debris in it. Um, you want to make sure that you keep animals out. Um, and what's most important for us here in, in our region is make sure that we prevent mosquitoes from having access to that water. Um, any little bit of water that is out and about, mosquitoes will use it to lay their eggs and um, then we're in trouble. <laughs> Especially the, the, the people like me that get stung like a lot from mosquitoes. Um, so we have one of these uh, portable, I don't know if it's portable, but it's, it's, it's a fabric. Um, collapsible. Rain, collapsible <coughs> rain barrel here. This is ideal for somebody that is not a homeowner, that is renting maybe a house, um, and wants to set up something that is not too permanent. Um, and there's a whole bunch in the back, so all you people that are here, you know, please make sure you take one with you. Um, and they're super simple to install. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to take away some of the stuff here on the top. So it has, it has really everything that you need to set up a rain barrel. It, it, it has a little faucet at the bottom where you take out your rainwater. Um, it has a little overflow on the top. Um, it has this mesh. I don't know if you guys can see that on the camera. Mm -hmm. yeah. It has this mesh to keep your debris out. Now, <clears throat> the mesh is a little bit big, so it'll be fine to keep leaves out. Um, but I would probably go and maybe get like a, um, a screen door mesh or like a window mesh that you put over this. Uh, you want something that's smaller than um, a sixteenth of an inch of a gap, which is 
what they tell us is what keeps the mosquitoes out, <laughs> right? Which is why we use them for doors and windows. <laughs> so if you can get something like that, preferably something that is either a fabric or stainless steel so it doesn't rust. Um, and then essentially you would use your gutters and redirect them so they basically just go in there. Um, and voila, that's it. You know, really doesn't need much more, right? Um, there's a whole bunch of different gutter connections that you can use. You have these regular elbows, which are usually at the bottom of your downspouts. <clears throat> All you can do is you can, you can cut your regular gutter and just move this one further up. You know, you can do that. Um, you can <coughs> get little plastic ones that are flexible. You know, you can move these around and then adjust them, stretch them out if you need to. Um, there's some more, um, more sophisticated ones that have like a little lip on there where you can, you know, you could cut up the screen and actually have a closed system. Mm -hmm. So there's really no access for mosquitoes and debris to come in. So it basically would connect directly to that. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and then I, I kind of like this one uh, quite well too. So this comes with a little screen on the top. So <clears throat> depending on where your barrels are located, uh, if you have like a closed system, you might want to have something where you can grab the, the leaves out, you know? So uh, this kind of captures some of the, the larger dirt that you have. Um, <clears throat> and then as well, oh yeah, and what I wanted to say as well about the, uh, the finer mesh, uh, it also helps when you have like, like a, an asphalt roof and you got that little gravel stuff that comes down, you want to make sure that that doesn't go, get into your tank because then otherwise you have a lot of sediments in the tank, which might eventually clog you up. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so these barrels here, we're giving them away today for free. So yeah, everybody here in the back, um, grab one. <laughs> for the people online, you know, use the rebates and get some for yourself. <laughs> Um, all right, so let's go to the next slide, please. All right, so I've got a bunch of examples here um, of rain barrels. Uh, I just was surfing the internet yesterday trying to look what people have done for the installation. <clears throat> so this one's pretty cool. So he used um, that like a flexible uh, downspout to go into the top of the barrel. Um, <clears throat> and he's got like a little hose connected to it. The only thing that's missing on this one is I'll probably elevate it a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> the more elevation you have, it's easier for you to extract the water from it, um, since most of the water consumption will be just gravity fed. Um, also, depending on where you live, but um, for LA County, if you want to get the rebate, you have to lift it up at least six inches from the ground. That's a requirement. <clears throat> so next slide, please. So this one, they, they found a lot better. So they did this little wooden um, foundation. You wanna make sure that you have something that's really solid. These barrels get quite heavy once they're full, um, <clears throat> but that looks really good. So he has enough space to have a watering can below it. Um, you know, he's got that plastic um, flexible downspout on top as well. Um, and he's got a little overflow there on the side. So that's perfect. Usually you want to connect your overflow to somewhere where it actually goes into your vegetation uh, so it doesn't just get wasted. Uh, you want to make sure that you know you get as much as possible on your active water collection, but then you know if there's extra, use your passive landscaping to actually uh, use all that water, right? Next slide, please. Okay, well, this is actually the exact same barrel that we have here today. Um, so this is actually one that's, you know, it's nice and round once it's fully um, filled up with water. That one has an extra faucet, a little bit higher. Does this one have it as well? Uh, no, it doesn't, but you can, you can probably just cut it a little hole and put an extra faucet. Again, this one probably should be a little bit higher just to make it easier for you to get to the water. That's probably why they put that extra faucet on there. Um, I'm not too keen on having that water splashing too much on the top, but you know, if they get that a little bit closer, that would be ideal. <laughs> Go ahead to the next one. 
All right, this is, this is really cool. So this is what I kind of done at my place as well. Um, I just put some center blocks and that's how I lifted it up to, to be high enough. Um, and they got a really, I don't know if you can see that, the contrast is not very good on the screen, but <clears throat> they got this little downspout diverter in there. Um, I didn't even get them like for maybe 15 bucks at Home Depot. And um, <clears throat> essentially, it makes it a lot easier to get the, get the rainwater because you don't have to cut your gutters. Um, you don't have to divert the bottom of the gutter. It essentially acts as your collector and your vent at the same time. Um, all you need to do is just drill a hole, stick that in there, turn it around, and basically the water that flows on the sides of your gutters just gets collected. If there's ever an overflow, it just goes down through the middle. Um, I was trying to get, see if I could get a lot today at Home Depot, but unfortunately I wasn't. Usually the question that I get when I hand them around and show these people is kind of like, how does this work? It has a hole in the middle. <laughs> so you can see the, the hole right there. Yeah, so basically what how it works, it just uses surface tension uh, of water along the sides of the gutters. So all, most, most of the water will actually go to, through the sides and then fill up your, your barrel. And then you still have that opening in the middle if you overflow. Uh, so this is a really super easy way to install it. Um, I, you can even see it. These people actually put a little sticker right by their faucet that says, you know, drink. Yeah, so a lot of people do that. I think there's some cities that require that. If you install rainwater, so put little stickers on there, not to drink it. I think it's kind of obvious, but you know, I guess they get little stickers to do that. Um, <clears throat> now this barrel is um, like this white opaque gut barrel. Um, I would probably paint it something that is not opaque, um, or make sure that it's, that it's really shaded. You want to make sure that you don't get too much light. On it, and I'll, I'll talk about that when we talk about the rain barrel maintenance a little bit more as well. Let's go ahead to the next slide. Okay, so this is the top of the barrel. This is a regular one of these 55 gallon drums. Um, it has a little screen, hard to see in the contrast, um, but they had a lot of rain. They don't have an overflow, uh, so it filled up all the way to the top, and now you got a little pump of water that is kind of like. You know, a big invitation for mosquitoes. Um, so that's something you want to avoid, not just mosquitoes, it also um, you know, creates algae, and then you know, the water is going to start getting really smelly. Uh, so this is something that you want to avoid. If that happens at your home, you know, very easy solution, just drain it so it goes low. <laughs> you know, use the water for something else. Next slide. Uh, okay, so this, this were actually my first two barrels at my home. <laughs> Um, I only was able to connect it to one downspout at a time. In the meantime, I've expanded my system. Um, and so what I did is I connected just a little hose. And uh, basically, once one barrel fills up, it fills the next one. So I just basically daisy chains two barrels together. I got them on the center blocks. Uh, in the meantime, this is all looks a little old. This is an old picture. In the meantime, this looks a lot more sophisticated. Um, but that's how I started. I had these black drums. Uh, I painted them white, mostly to match the house. Um, but then it also had a good side effect that the barrels get a lot less hot. Um, it protects, um, you know, the sunlight from, you know, um, creating more algae inside the, uh, the barrels. Um, and this picture was taken right after uh, after it rained because the ground was all wet. <laughs> Let's go ahead to the next picture. All right, this is a few years later. Um, I actually upgraded um, and added a cistern. So this is a, is a 265 gallon cistern. Um, I know the angle is a little bit weird, um, but in the shaded part that you can see in this picture, there's center blocks down there as well, so it's also lifted up. Um, and then the downspout, goes directly into the cistern and it's fully covered on the top. Uh, so there's really, there, there's no opening. Uh, I've got my vent right there. It has a uh, 16 of an inch mesh in there as well. So there's nothing that can fly in there. Um, and it's, it's on the side. 
so you know there's not not a stuff that that falls into. Uh, at the bottom, I just have a regular off on it. I use to connect the hose to it. I can use to water the front of the of the house. Um, usually, there's enough pressure so I can get it all the way to the backyard as well uh, on the opposite side of the of the house. Uh, it flows a little bit slow, but you know, just lay out the hose, let it run. <laughs> So this is in my backyard when I painted the barrels. <laughs> so yeah, I painted them white, make sure that you know they don't get as much heat on it. Painting the barrels is super simple. You know, just sand them down a little bit and then just paint them over. Um, you want to use some kind of outdoor paint, make sure that you know it doesn't wash away with the rain. Um, and then just get creative. All right, here we got somebody that was really creative. I think it was at a school somewhere. Oh no, I think it's a private residence. Um, so they were really creative with their painting, which is nice. I mean, so just whatever, whatever you feel like, right? I mean, two girls, your home, um, make make them colorful. So they got four in a row. Uh, they got the bottoms connected. They got the tops connected. They got one downspout here with a little mesh filter. So this, this is a really nice one. I actually got a similar one in my home right now. Um, so that's really nice. You want to make sure that there's some somewhere on eye level so you can see if there's any dirt in there and you can just grab it and throw it away. Um, makes it super easy to maintain. Obviously, once you have rain barrels installed, uh, gutter maintenance is something that you'll have to do on a regular basis. So um, this kind of helps. You know, you get some of the dirt off the bottom. You don't always have to climb up and clean your gutters on top. All right, so this is a pretty sophisticated system as well. So they put them really high up, so they're trying to get some additional gravity going here, uh, making sure that they can use every little drop. Um, they even went more sophisticated by installing actually a little pump down here. So they can basically suck up the water out of those barrels and basically use it like any other garden hose. There's really no difference from you using city water or these barrel waters, you know, and it's it's just a regular um, 110 pump that you just plug in that got here. Um, I think this is this is the reason why I picked the the this picture because they also installed the beer bottle opener right next to it. <laughs> so they're saving water in multiple ways, you know, they're not just they're drinking beer into so water. <laughs> Yeah, again, we've got the overflows, we've got one downspout feeding four, we've got the four interconnected, um, pretty good system. They also have their overflow on hoses, so they can, you know, I guess when it rains, they can connect hoses and put them out to some kind of tree or somewhere, some shrub, so that none of that water gets wasted. All right, next one. All right, this person, they really went overboard. They are way. A lot of, <laughs> a lot of barrels. Uh, they all got the nicely painted white uh, from the shape. These look like those blue barrels. Um, usually those are the fruit plate barrels. They're really good. If you, get, if you can get one of those, they got them on center blocks. Um, you can see at the bottom, they got them interconnected. Not only got the, do they have them interconnected, they also have little balls in between them so they can isolate one from the other. Um, and they've got two downspouts feeding them. So you've got one right here, and then one over there, and they use those little um, downspout filters as well. Um, I guess they couldn't find them in brown, so they're in white. Uh, but it looks great, they got plants on it, so you can decorate it, you know, however you want it. This is, you know, becomes part of your, of your home. Next slide. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about you know, it's not just collecting the water and you carrying buckets all the way around. Uh, you can collect water and think of any kinds of system that you want to use that water and irrigate your landscaping, right? Um, <clears throat> so a couple months back, I did a presentation on the Oya system. Um, I guess it would break the time frame for the presentation to go into all details of that. But essentially, what OES are, they're 
they're clay pots that you bury into the ground. Um, and the water precipitates through the clay. So uh, if, if you see those, those terracotta pots, those red pots that you can buy in most hardware stores and garden centers, um, they're not waterproof, right? Uh, so I don't know if you, if you use, use them in your home, when you water them, you can kind of see the little rings around, right, at the bottom. Yeah, <clears throat> so the way that works, um, they're just baked clay. If they're not painted, they're, they're water permeable. Um, and you can, you can make little pots out of them, put, bury them into the ground. Um, I have a little workshop that we do on that as well, where we build some of them hands-on. Um, <clears throat> and then you can interconnect them. Essentially how it works. The plants around the Oyas will suck water from the ground as they need it. And the Oyas will release the water if the ground around them is dry. Mm -hmm. So it only uses the water that is really needed by the plant, not more, not less. <clears throat> so here, you know, we have rain twice, three times a year. <clears throat> so you fill up all your barrels, you connect them to your Oyas, that will last you the entire year. It will last you the entire year because you won't owe water. You know, the plants will just use exactly what they need. Um, <clears throat> go to the next one. Um, or you can do like a gravity drip system. I mean, I know this graphic shows like some kind of agriculture thing, but you can do that at home as well. You can do that with lawn. You can do that with your trees. You can do it with your shrubs. You can do it with your edibles. Uh, you lay out your system. If your tank is high enough, you know, that will just slowly feed through and you can put little timers on there. There's timers that work without pressure or with low pressures that <clears throat> don't need to have like most, most sprinkler timers that need like a big 80 PSI, which is your regular pressure for city water. Um, but there are some out there that don't require that. They can just release the water uh, and, and have your drip irrigation fed by that. Again, no need to connect to the city water. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Now, if you have some extra money left over and space in your backyard, you can, you can dig in a barrel or a tank, or a cistern in this case. Um, <clears throat> I think this is a south 1,000 gallon um, cistern. Uh, has a big manhole on the top. Uh, so they just dug the hole, put that in there. Obviously, you'll need some kind of pumps to get to the water because now it's lower than the ground. Um, but, you know, you can completely hide it. Um, out of sight, uh, and you have your water storage. Next slide, please. All right, so I took these pictures from Mike Garcia, and I have to mention his name because I didn't ask permission to, to use those pictures. Uh, so he's with Environment, uh, Enviroscape LA. He's um, an environmental landscaper. <laughs> um, and he's part of the Greenaway Associates as well. And this is actually pictures from his backyard. So what he did is he, he removed his swimming pool. He removed his swimming pool and put in all kinds of storage, water storage underground, um, <clears throat> where he collects rainwater, it goes into the storage, and he's got a little circulating, circulating pump um, that is hidden in the vegetation, you can't even tell where it is. And it feeds through a koi pond. <laughs> so the water circulates through the, the kois, the fish to make sure that there's no mosquitoes, they'll just eat them. <laughs> so that's so you can have open water. So there are ways to have open water, there's no way. Um, <clears throat> you just have to have the right fish for it. <laughs> they'll eat the mosquitoes, so he doesn't have mosquitoes in his backyard. He's got water circulating. The humidity, like in his backyard, is a little bit higher. You know, LA has a really dry climate, but you know, you go to his backyard and it's kind of like you're, you're, you're in a completely different place. And he's got water circulating through there the whole year round. All his vegetation is fed by it. Um, he's got tons of native plants around it, and uh, he's got lots of edibles and stuff as well. So, you know, you can get really creative and, and get some really cool um, water harvesting systems that, you know, go, go beyond what people imagine just regular rain barrels. Uh, the nice thing about the, the koi pond is that he also has, an, it's not on this, in none of these pictures, but he has them piped through a little aquaponics system where he grows um, his, his edible plants. And um, aquaponics is a system where basically you, 
you, you grow plants that just are in water, they're using the, uh, essentially the fish poop to grow. <laughs> uh, in, in exchange, uh, they suck out the nitrogen from the water, which makes it livable for the fish. It kind of balances the whole water, so you don't really need any chemicals at all to maintain this rainwater system. Uh, it's like all, like a closed system that kind of like just maintains itself. You know, every now and then you just need to fish, uh, feed the fish a little bit, and the rest, the rest is self-maintained. All right, let's go to the next slide. Oh, here's some cool accessories. Uh, I've mentioned some of them already. Uh, so we got this uh, on the lower right side, the um, little filter for the downspout. Uh, it's really cool to kind of get rid of. So it has a really fine mesh. It's a little bit more sophisticated than the one that I have here. So this one has a little <clears throat> really rough grid. It essentially has the same purpose, but that one that is in the picture has that really fine mesh um, that keeps one mosquitoes out, and it's also fine enough to keep all the gravel from your roof out. Um, you'll see when it rains a lot, people that have those asphalt shingles or asphalt roofs that has that little really fine gravel that eventually washes off, which is why you have to replace the roof every 15 years. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it, it all gets caught in there and you catch it before it actually goes into your barrel and then you can just wipe it off. Um, then this is the timer I mentioned. Um, it's, it's one of these low pressure timers that you can use for your irrigation system. You just directly connect it to your barrel and then have that fed into your irrigation system. Now what you want to make sure is, I think the city doesn't like it, if you interconnect city water and rainwater, so just make sure you keep your system separate. <laughs> um, plus you don't want to use the regular pressure on the low pressure timer, but they're super simple. You just set up, you know, you can set them up to, to provide water 20 minutes a day or twice a day. Um, to your plants, and then it just slowly uses the water that's in your barrels. You don't even have to think about it. You know, it just takes care of itself, right? Next slide. All right, let's talk a little bit about the basic maintenance. So obviously barrels, um, you know, we like those systems where you don't have to do anything, but you know, you still have to do a little bit something. <laughs> and um, I didn't know that, but I Googled that yesterday, what the maintenance is supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> and I found that there is actually an American Rainwater Catchment System Association. <laughs> and this is their recommendation. So, sweep out your gutters every three months as needed. Um, to be honest, I only do it right before it rains. <laughs> but, uh, so here in LA, we do that once a year. Um, <laughs> inspect and clean filters and screens every three months. Again, I do that once a year, just right before it rains. Um, and then inspect balls and check for micro leaks. Um, I think if you installed everything correctly, you know, you usually want to check that when, when you initially install them so they don't have any leaks. But this is plastic. A lot of these barrels are all plastic, or if you, even if you use wooden barrels, you know, I, I put a picture of this really old barrel here in, in, in the back. Um, so stuff will eventually crack. Do you have a question? I do. Uh, what would you repair a micro leak with? Like um, spray rubber or? Yeah, so um, if, if, if it's a plastic barrel, I would probably use some, some kind of food grade silicone. Okay. Uh, just some kind of caulking material that you can use. Um, if a wood barrel cracks, there's really not much you can do. <laughs> uh, or what about like that, that yeah. stuff? Oh, so if this, you know, if, if you move this one around a lot, it might create cracks in it. It might rip because of the fabric. Um, what's, what really works well is those tent repair kits, you know, the, the stuff that you use for your camping. Um, you can get that in form of a, of a adhesive tape that you can just stick on there. Um, there's some that are kind of like a little glue paste that you stick on there and then you have a little fabric that you put on there. Uh, I guess you want to make sure that you get something that's similar color that doesn't look like patchwork. Um, or you can try and do it from the inside, but yeah. Um, so these, since they are collapsible, you might come across them that, that they're not as durable as some of the, you know, the uh, static barrels that you just installed permanently. <clears throat> um, all right, let's go to the next slide. All right, some of the common issues that we have with rainwater harvesting. Um, 
smelly or just call it water, mosquitoes, algae, saving parts, to rebuild up. Um, a lot of these can be fixed by location, mm -hmm. where you place your barrels. You want to make sure that they're in a shady spot, and you want to make sure that they're not in the sun. Uh, if they're not in the sun, you won't really have much of a smelly um, water or algae because those two are linked to each other. The algae is what you, what you smell. Um, <clears throat> you definitely don't want a barrel like this that is fully open. You know, that's, that's how my grandma used to collect the, the rainwater, but <clears throat> now I know I... <laughs> Um, because we'll get tons of mosquitoes, mosquitoes in there, you get a lot of debris in there, your water will, will start becoming really foul, uh, you're going to have that sulfur smell on it. Um, and um, I mean, the plants wouldn't mind, but you know, the people that are around it probably might. Um, <clears throat> so you want to make sure that you try and put together a closed system, uh, seal out any, 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 any sunlight from it that will prevent the algae. Uh, if you seal it out completely, if you have a little mesh on it that is small enough, that will keep the mosquitoes out as well. And oh, can someone get me the little one of the green bags in the back? It has like little donuts in there. I just wanted to show those. I don't want to promote any product, but it is something that I use. No, I think it's in the other bag. <coughs> there should be something in there. Thank you so much. So I'm not going to show the brand name. I'm just going to show what it actually is. <clears throat> so they look like little donuts. Um, basically, this is a biological mosquito control. Um, so they just kill off any larvae that you might have from mosquitoes. Uh, you just pop one of these into your barrels, and then you get to the next year. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's about one. Well, they 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 uh, list it per square feet rather than per gallons, but yeah, I think that what I do is I just I just use one of these. Um, it doesn't really do anything um, to your plants. They, they don't mind it. Um, <clears throat> doesn't do anything for your pets either. If the barrel is dry, this just really dries up. Mm. And then once there's water... barrel that doesn't have an overflow so the water fills up it fills up the, you know if you have that little lip on the top water will fill up you want to make sure that you avoid that so if that happens to you just drain out a little bit so you're below the screen um, and that's really it you know making sure it stays out of the out of the sun that it's closed off Um, that will take care of all the main parts um, and then failing parts obviously you know just look for leaks and fix as needed okay let's go ahead to the next slide all right so <clears throat> barrel cleaning in reality you shouldn't really have to do that very often um, I've done it once on one of my barrels because it was really smelly um, and it's one of the barrels that is like in full sunlight, which is not an ideal location for it. Um, <clears throat> so you can do a little um, shock chlorination treatment is what they call it, where you just put in a little bit of chlorine 
into the into the barrel. You try to swish around, swish around the water in it. Um, make sure that it gets rid of whatever bacteria is creating. Usually, it's a bacteria that you can smell. You know, all the uh, <clears throat> it creates that. Um, if you think that you need to brush down the barrel, the inside of the barrel, um, use a really soft brush. Don't use anything hard, especially on those plastic barrels. Um, essentially, if you if you if you scratch the surface on the inside of the barrel too much, you basically just create more surface for stuff to attach to. Um, then also, what I'd like to mention is that over time, the barrels will create a little biofilm on the inside of the barrel, and that's actually really good. It's good because it protects the barrel, and at the same time, it, it you know gives some extra nourishment for your plants. <laughs> um, and if that's well balanced. Um, then you really never should have to use um, any chlorine to, uh, to treat your barrels. If I think this is really only the case if you have a fully closed system that you can't really get access to, and you might need to do that. And you know, if, you, if your water quality is bad, then you can do that. Um, you can also use vinegar; it just use needs a lot more for you to do that. Um, and then just remember to uh, not drain the bleach water into your landscaping, otherwise it will fill everything else. Make sure that you can't smell the bleach anymore before you drain it. All right, let's go to the next slide. Cool, rainwater quality. All right, so, did you know that rainwater is better for your plants than city water? Yes. <laughs> well, you know now. Um, <clears throat> so city water contains chlorine, fluoride, magnesium, and other chemicals that can potentially be hazards to plants. Um, so unless you kind of like put your water out and let the chlorine evaporate, you know, when you use it directly out of your hose, you're actually feeding it with a whole bunch of toxins for the plants that they don't like. Also, rainwater is a lot softer. I mentioned that earlier, especially here in LA, because a lot of our water comes from the Colorado River, which in itself is really hard. So, I mean, when, when you take a shower at home and you get the old salt deposit, uh, on there, that's that's exactly here in Santa Clarita as well. Worse. It's yeah, worse. It's yeah. probably even worse. Much worse than yeah. <clears throat> Do you know what percentage you get from the Colorado River here? We don't. We use yeah. uh, groundwater and uh, uh, water project river. Right. So, yeah, groundwater would in itself usually have a lot of deposits and minerals in it, so it's not a lot. Um, what happens with rainwater, especially in an urban area like here, is that it becomes a little bit more acidic than uh, your regular tap water. So you're probably looking at a pH that is below seven. So you're looking at something between six and seven for rainwater. Uh, that is due to a lot of the metals that we have in our frame, <laughs> uh, unfortunately from our pollution. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, there's a lot of plants that actually prefer that. Uh, if you have tomatoes, if you have um, any kinds of large fruits, you have greens, um, like you, your stock beans and stuff like that, they actually like more acidic soils. Uh, so you have to do less of your ground treatment by just using the water like it is. How about native flowers like roses and honeysuckle? Do they, do they like that harder water? Um, well, no, plants in general don't like hard water. Okay. Um, so they might, they might do well with some more acidic water, um, but definitely none of the plants like the hard water. Go ahead. Um, my in, indoor plants love rainwater when I capture some of it and bring it inside to water yes, them. Yes, that's awesome. So yeah, if you collect your rainwater outside, you can obviously use it for your indoor plants as well. It's not limited to your outdoor stuff. They love it. <clears throat> so yeah, so the more you can collect of rainwater and use it for your vegetation, it's overall, I mean, that's what they get out in nature anyways, right? Um, so today, I don't know how we are with time. Can we do a little water test? Do we have enough time? Okay, so I got a little sample from one of my barrels here, this is rainwater, and I'm going to need assistance. assistant. Somebody help me. Can I get one of the Sierra Club volunteers? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we got rainwater and we got tap water. 
And I haven't done this test at home, so this is the first time we're trying this. Hopefully it'll get the results that I'm expecting. So here we got the tap water. And I just brought my little aquarium uh, test strips. So basically what they do is they measure pH, they measure the chlorine, they measure nitrates, uh, they measure the total hardness. So this is kind of the information that we want to know. Um, it would be nice if we had another one that tells us a little bit about the heavy metals and stuff that's in there. But um, I think this one will be good. The pH will tell us if there's metals in there. Um, the chlorine will tell us if there's city water or not. Um, although I filled it up this morning, so maybe some of the chlorine already dis dissipated. Um, nitrates, we shouldn't see any. Uh, so let's, let's give that a try. Um, I'll give you one strip. <clears throat> Essentially the way that this works is you just dip it in there real quick and then lay it on the side. Yep. Yeah, we're gonna do this together <clears throat> so that we can see the colors changing it. And I don't know the people that are filming if they wanna come closer. Um, I know it's going to be a little bit crowded, but this is going to be fun to see how the colors change. <laughs> is it possible or should I come closer to the camera? Come closer to the camera. Alright, so, so we'll dip it over here and then we'll bring the strips yeah, I can move that. Okay, so, so we'll dip it over here. Okay, so we're going to dip it. You're not going to shake off the water. So within the first 15 seconds, we should be able to see the pH, right? So yeah, so we just dip it in there. One, two, take it out, don't shake it. And let's walk over to the cameras. <clears throat> let's see, well, can, you, can you guys see it here? Mm -hmm. All right, so this one here, that's rainwater. This yeah, one here is a city water, okay? You can already see that the pH is different, which is the first little color thing here. Mm -hmm. This one's a lot darker, um, and this is probably, yeah, it's around neutral color, so it's around seven. This one is, it's pretty light, so you're looking at about... 6.4? Yeah, 6.4. Uh, let's check the hardness. You can see that the city water is a lot harder. You see that a lot darker. We're looking at... Um, maybe about 150 yeah, parts 150. per million. Um, and this kind of looks like pretty much neutral, maybe yeah, maybe 20. Yeah. Um, so the chlorine already dissip dissipated in the city water, so I guess if we would get a fresh sample, we would probably see that. Um, but, you know, rainwater obviously doesn't have any chlorine. Neither of them have any nitrates. So, you know, Hardness, that's obviously the big difference here. Um, and the pH, um, <clears throat> we have the, uh, basically the, the carbonate is neutral on the rainwater and it's really dark on the city water. So we're looking at about uh, maybe 120 milligrams per liter. Diego, yeah. I have Santa Clarita tap water. If you I have, have Santa Clarita tap water? Let's do that. Another strip. Let's do that. Let's try. Let's see. Let's see if we go crazy on the hardness. <laughs> well, it's been sitting in my water bottle for a while, so. It has. Do we have tap water that we can we get do, like, fresh? We do. That, that one. That jug from oh, like an hour ago. Water? Yeah, from mm -hmm. like an hour well, ago. I'll but, get that in a second. Yeah. yeah, well, they asked me to do something hands on, and it's kind of hard to do install a barrel you know, in a classroom, but at least we can do a little bit of science. Is it, is it local tap? Yep. Local tap? <clears throat> All right, so my tap water that's LED WP, and this is my rain barrel, and it has rained what last week? Yeah, so it's, last it's week. fairly fresh. Nice. <clears throat> So I've got a question. Um, I'm hoping then I can also dump like pasta water and potato, like the water I boiled food in, that little extra food water. Can I pour that in there too? Or is that gonna make a mess? So pasta water, like, do you cook it with salt or without no salt? No salt. You cook it without salt yeah. so you don't follow the Italian I learned, recipes? Well, but I learned that the, <laughs> well, I'm Italian, but I learned that the salt actually, it damages the pots and you're getting some leachate from the pots actually okay. in there. 
Um, so traditionally for, I know this, this is off subject, but traditionally <laughs> pasta, you want to have the salinity of the water more or less the same as the Mediterranean Ocean. <laughs> wow. All right. Cool. But you don't want PFAS in there. There we go. All right, so let's wait about 15 seconds. <clears throat> so do you think the starch, you, you, though? You can okay. kind of see the the hardness. So yeah, the starch shouldn't really make it. It wouldn't like, yeah, affect the plants? In fact, there's actually nutrients for your plants, so okay. that should be totally fine. Great. Um, <clears throat> yeah, pH is neutral, which is fine. Hardness, pretty much the same as on, on LEWP. I mean, this one is already starting to dry, so it's, it's getting lighter again. But we're looking at, yeah, probably 150. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to see similar. that the chlorine level is down, that we don't have that in our city water as much as we used to. Okay. Um, if you go like to downtown or any beach city, that that level is really high. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, you know, I, I used to treat a lot of my uh, aquarium water because of the chlorine, um, oh. because obviously I was getting fish. <laughs> oh. So, yeah, but I'm I'm very happy to see that we don't actually see it. Go ahead. Did you talk about your aquaponics? I didn't talk about my personal aquaponics, but I did talk about Mike Garcia's aquaponics. Okay. I, I, I just want to say I'm witnessing the best tomato plants I've ever grown, and they're still growing and producing red tomatoes this time of year because they are grown in the aquaponics with the fish and the right. fish effluent and so, they're just amazing awesome. root systems. Awesome. Right. So maybe we'll do a different workshop just on that alone. Yeah. Um, so let's I go back to our. Rainwater. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, oh, okay. Looks like we're going towards the end. Rebates. So you can get rebates for your rain barrels. Um, rain barrels. If you get one of those 55-gallon drums, not. I don't know how much these cost, but if you get like the. the those rain, are only twenty-five dollars at Walmart. Twenty-five dollars. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I don't think they will qualify for the rebate. Somebody no. will have to double check on that because they're not permanent installed. Right. Uh, probably not, but um, volume-wise, yes, but maybe not. Anyway, so the regular food grade barrels, um, you know, the blue barrels that you got, they're, um, I think they're about 60 dollars $60 per barrel. So with that rebate, you know, it brings them down to half the price. Um, and you get, I guess, $35 per barrel. Um, I was surprised that the quantity was only two, um, and um, I remember that when I applied for the rebate for my sister, they wouldn't give it to me because I already had the barrels. Um, so I don't know it's it's kind of a timing issue when you apply for these. You also um, have to have your entire roof have gutters too. You can't have just gutters on one section. The whole yeah, thing has to have gutters. And they make you submit pictures. So you have to submit pictures of the installation. You have to submit the receipt where you bought them. They have to be new. You can't reuse old ones and try and get a rebate. Um, most, of, I don't know about Santa Clarita specifically, but most of the rebates goes through so-called uh, WaterSmart. Uh, there might be some local municipal rebates as well. Um, I don't know if they allow you to double dip and get rebates from both. I don't know if we have somebody from Santa Clarita here that knows about that. Um, but it's, it's definitely some help to get you started with that. Now, I would also keep an eye on, on any local farmer's market. Um, I think at least two of my barrels, I got them for free at the farmer's market. Every now and then they give them away. Um, so just keep an eye posted, visit your local farmer's market, support your farmer's market. <laughs> Uh, I see if we can catch some rain barrels. Um, let's see, do I have one more slide? I think we're um, towards the end, one. right? Oh yeah, uh, so as I said at the beginning, I'm with Serena Way Associates. We're a nonprofit. Um, we're about um, training people on how to become gardeners, how to do environmental friendly landscaping, 
will be expanded into water conservation as well. Um, our next event is going to be on Sunday, January 8th in Culver City. We're going to teach people on how to prune their fruit trees. Uh, if you want to know more about organization, go ahead and scan the QR code. It will get you to our link tree. Um, we're always on the lookout for volunteers. And if you just want to attend our events, all our events are free. Um, and as I said, we're in Culver City. And if there's any other questions, I'm here. Go ahead. Um, so can you tell me about like the ideal kind of surface to put under a rain barrel, especially a collapsible one? Because I'm thinking I saw a pile of bricks on my street that's been there for months, and I, I'd like to reuse stuff. Could I use bricks? And if yeah, I did... So, so most okay. of the center blocks are usually exactly six inches tall. Okay. So if you put them like on the, uh, the hole on the top, where the holes are on the top, mm -hmm. put them up like that. That will give you exactly the six inches that most of the rebate programs require for you to qualify for the rebate. Okay. Um, if you can do it higher, if you want to stack, you know, like you need at least two for, for a 55-gallon to kind of get the surface. If you can stack four um, together, it gives you a little bit of higher, to, you know, you get your 12 inches up. Is there an Maybe. ideal height? Like how high would be is good? Well, Does it matter? Essentially, it's the higher you can go, was you still being able to access the barrel. Okay. You know, the higher you go, the more gravity you can use to drain your, your barrel, right? Okay. So if, if, you're, if you're on a flat uh, terrain, it doesn't really matter. But if you have a slightly slanted terrain, and let's say your, your backyard goes slightly upwards and you have the barrel near the house, you want to be a little bit higher so you can use the water all the way on the opposite side. Right. If if your terrain goes down, then it doesn't matter. You know. Then you just mm -hmm. want to make sure that you have enough room below it to, um, to put a bucket or watering can or something beneath it. Um, for this particular one, <clears throat> I might get like a piece of plywood or something. So lift lift up the uh, you know use some of these center blocks or bricks or whatever you have uh, to kind of get it up at least six inches and then put a piece of plywood on it. Um, because it doesn't have a solid face, right? right? So it needs it needs this little the six legs to stand on something. Um, so you want to make sure that you have it wouldn't be solid. a rot problem with the wood. It should be dry, not a concern. No, that's fine. Okay. I mean, unless unless you spill a lot of water. Okay. <laughs> so what I would do is to make sure that you don't spill the water on the ground. Just connect something to your to your overflow. Mm -hmm. Connect something to this little spigot here. Yeah, you can put a hose in it and put it to some kind of shrub or something that's nearby. Okay. So when it overflows, it goes to that and it doesn't wet your um, your wood. If I wanted to have that go underground, would that be advisable or is that going to get mosquitoes? Like if I wanted to water my plants at the roots? No, that's fine. Yeah, okay. you, can, you can use that. Uh, if you, if you, you mean like connecting it to like a drip irrigation or something? Yeah, like, like put a hose on there and then just put it right in like my thirstiest shrub. Yeah. I mean, there's... Unfortunately, that there's this new kind of mosquitoes that we're seeing more and more that need hardly any water. So just the very little bit that is out there that take advantage. Um, but yeah, I mean, the more you can avoid having any open water, if, if, if you use drip irrigation or if you use Oyas, and you basically keep the water underground where the roots are, you should be fine. Okay. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? One more question? Um, where does one get these various attachments? Is this something you get at like Home Depot or? Yeah, so this morning we went to Home Depot and trying to get all this stuff. Unfortunately, the one we went to hardly had anything. Mm. Um, most of the stuff I brought from home. Um, yeah, in normally any kind of hardware uh, store or um, gardening supply store should have this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also order stuff online. There's, there's tons of companies that provide that. I don't want to mention any particular one okay. in specific, but yeah, um, yeah, they're they're very easy to to find. Um, we already mentioned Home Depot. They didn't have anything in the store this morning, but okay. on the website they actually have every item I showed on the, yeah. on the slides because that's where I stole the pictures from. <laughs> Okay. So since, since uh, I stole that picture, I'll mention that. One more thing: the event that you have coming up is that yes. listed on your website? Not yet. 
Okay. I'm waiting for the for the text to be written up so I can post it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we usually have them on Eventbrite. Um, and unfortunately, my my email is getting covered up. Can we get the screen a little bit? Can you tilt that up a little bit so we can capture that? There you go. So there's my email. If you're interested in any of our events, uh, just send me an email, and I'll get you more information. I can also get you onto a mailing list if you want to. Just let me know. So it's Diego at dewla.com. That's my personal email. Okay. And um, I can send you more information about the Green Away Associates and about the events we're having. Terrific. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Yay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, lunchtime already. Are we doing a break or are we? All right, we'll be back online. What time? In 30 minutes. In 30 minutes. All right, stay tuned. Come back in 30 minutes. Everybody that's online, and obviously people here, enjoy the food. Yay. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.